Howdy folks, I'm kind of doing things the wrong way around today. You're getting two videos today, but you're getting the bonus video first. This is naval action once again. And the reason you're getting this before the main event is because, for various reasons, I can't actually show you the main event before six o'clock tonight, Central European time. Um, yeah, I know it all sounds very mysterious. So <laughs> Stick around. 6 o'clock CET today, today's main video, it's going to be a World of Tanks video, will go up and, uh, and, and hopefully you'll understand why I had to wait until 6 o'clock before I could actually publish the video. So, today's bonus video, it's naval action again and um, I've been getting into some big games, the kind of games where I can be reduced to matchwood in one broadside. They've got victories, they've got surprises, they've got in Comalese, and they've got Santa Simas. Oh my lord. What am I doing in a game like this? In a cutter. Well, this is what happens when you click that PvP button in naval action, rather than the PvP light button, which I think restricts the kind of ships that you go up against to nothing bigger than a, a brig or a snow. Whereas if you hit the PvP button, you get into some truly massive games. And there is no matchmaking so far in naval action. None whatsoever. The game quite literally just grabs everybody who's sitting in the queue for the next game and puts them in the next game. And uh, It doesn't care what kind of ships you've chosen, so choose your ship wisely because well you do get into some absolutely epic games and while you're in a crappy little cutter like this you're little more than a spectator. But you can still at least distract some fire from the bigger ships and if you get in close enough without being noticed, and it's not that difficult to get close to some of these bigger ships without being noticed, you just have to time your moment, wait for them to be fully engaged by somebody else. These little cutters are so small that you can get under the guns of the bigger ships. Of course, the problem there is you only have some six pounder cannons, so you can't actually get through the armour <laughs> of the bigger ships. And if they do notice you're sneaking up on them, yeah, it, it, it really doesn't end well. If you're uh, if you're sailing one of these things in a battle against first-rate ships of the line, <laughs> let's just say the outcome of the battle is really going to depend on what you do. But they're amazing to watch. But while that's all very nice, the focus of this video is something that's been recently introduced, well, relatively recently introduced into naval action, and that's to do with the weather. It's not all Caribbean sunshine and rum anymore. Well, not all the time anyway. Get a load of that. It's like a good day in the North Sea. <laughs> I've been in worse seas than that. That's nothing. <laughs> Although I have to admit, you know, I was in a slightly bigger boat. So <laughs> and it wasn't open to the elements like that thing is. So yeah, new weather systems in naval action, well I say new, they've been around for a while now, but I've just noticed them. Um, not 100% completely accurately modelled. If you try to run a ship like that, or oh, going to be completely accurate, a boat like that, because it only has one mast, you try to run a boat like that in seas like that, in wind like that, <laughs> with a full set of sails on, well, you'd either snap the mast off, or the ship would just flip over the second you turned it beam onto the sea. Standard procedure... Oh, look at that. Standard procedure when you're sailing in these kind of, of seas is to shorten the sails and turn and just basically steer with a rudder straight into the oncoming waves. Because if you turn the beam of the ship onto the swell, it, it'll flip the ship over. <laughs> and, especially if you're running with a full set of sails like that. So not 100% completely accurate yet. But um, And I don't actually know whether or not they're actually planning to implement that kind of feature. It would make, it would make the battles very short, <laughs> at least at first, until people got used to the idea of you know actually sailing in rough weather. Um, in previous videos, people have saying, what the hell are all these whistling noises that the crew keep making? Um, what that actually is, is um, the orders would be given to the crew via a whistle, known as a bosun's call. We still use them in, uh, in the Navy today, although we don't use them for issuing orders anymore. They're used more, more for ceremonial occasions like piping 
a flag officer on board and things like that. But um, and, and that's what these whistles are. Um, interesting little fact for you. Well, maybe not that interesting, but I'm going to tell you anyway. It is, to this day, illegal to whistle on board a ship in the Royal Navy. Um, it's just one of those naval laws that never ended up getting struck off the record books because it could be confused for an order. Um, you know, if you're in battle <laughs> or, or navigating at a critical moment and you suddenly start whistling away to yourself and somebody up in the rigging hears you and thinks, what's that, shorten the sails? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> you know, it could have serious consequences, so it was illegal to whistle um, on board Royal Naval ships. The only person allowed to whistle was the bosun, using the bosun's call to issue orders to the men in the rigging. That's also, believe it or not, why uh, stagehands in theatre used to give instructions to each other by whistling, because they were all ex-Royal Navy uh, deckhands. Um, and they would raise and lower the scenery and work in the rafters of the theatres, communicating to each other using whistles. So, there you go. It's amazing the useless information you learn when you come to my channel, isn't it? <laughs> Sailing in weather like this is uh, also one of the reasons why you have to do a thing called securing for sea when you're on board a warship. Any time the warship sails, you have to secure the ship for sea, particularly when you're sailing in rough weather like this, because you can imagine what would happen to anything that isn't bolted down to the deck if you're being tossed around on waves like this. So pretty much that's exactly what securing the sea is. Any loose objects have to be securely stowed. Now you take things up one step further when you secure the ship for action when it's about to go into combat because while you might get an embarrassing bump on the head if something hasn't been securely fastened down, you're in rough seas, the ship suddenly rolls over to starboard, the loose object goes flying and smacks you on the side of the head embarrassing, painful, but not life-threatening. On the other hand, if the ship takes a hit, all those loose objects have the potential to become deadly shrapnel. As well as that, even if you know loose objects don't kill people because they haven't been securely fastened down, the ships take a hit and they go flying around, then when you're dealing with the aftermath of the damage and you're trying to pump out a flooded section, for example, and the pump's constantly getting clogged up by old training shoes and porn magazines that nobody bothered securing for action, that tends to give your damage control officer a major sense of humour failure as well. So it's probably fair to say that compulsive, in fact obsessive compulsive tidiness is a very useful trait that they try to instill into sailors very early on in their training, even today. Now, in ships like this, when it actually came to exchanging fire with each other, the majority of casualties weren't actually caused by the shot fired from the cannon. Unless, of course, the enemy ship had specifically loaded grape shot with the intention of sweeping your decks and killing your crew and knocking the crew out of the rigging and so on and so on. But generally speaking, cannon balls fired from these guns were not the immediate cause of most of the injuries and fatalities. Any shot that penetrated the wooden hull of these ships was, you know, it's going to cause problems for the crew. But the major cause of injuries was actually the shrapnel, the wooden splinters that were flying all over the place as a result of the hull being penetrated. And, and this was the major cause of the injuries. Now, this isn't to say that you know getting penetrated by cannonballs isn't going to be a massive problem to the crew. Uh, it certainly could be, particularly if you manage to rake the ship from bow to stern by crossing the T. And um, what we mean by that is if you manage to deliver a sideways on broadside from your gun straight into the front or rear, the bow or the stern of the target ship, because inside these ships there were no internal bulkhead dividers. It was one long open deck on each of the gun decks, the top gun deck, the middle gun deck and the lower gun deck. So if you manage to get behind one of these ships and deliver a full broadside right into the rear for example where there wasn't an awful lot of uh, wooden thickness armour if you like, your cannonballs were going to travel the entire length of the ship and cause massive massive casualties. Quite a choice piece of action coming up here. First of all, we've got French ship, British ship, French ship, British ship, and then very, very shortly, another British ship. All, all I was going to say, steaming. <laughs> all, all sailing in line abreast. There is going to be one hell of an exchange of gunfire coming up here. There it goes. Just everybody shooting everybody else. But keep an eye on that British ship, the second one from the right. He's actually going to ram that French ship. The French ship makes it easy by turning into it. <laughs> and they're all just blasting away at each other at point-blank range. 
the splashes that you can see there are actually splinters of hull flying off and going into the water. Now the smaller ship up front is desperately trying to avoid a collision and as he turns, there we go, carronades in the bow of the ship managed to score a few more hits. But this big ship, he's in trouble. He's actually sinking. That smaller ship there, I, I, it's a brig or a snow, I'm not entirely sure which. It's a two-master. He's actually got the bowsprit right over the top of the gunwales on the starboard side of that three-mast ship of the line. And he may have more guns, but it's only the guns on the actual weather deck <laughs> that are above water. He's taken so much water on. This guy's actually going to sink him. And sure enough, about 30 seconds later, he's foundering pretty badly. And the second ship comes around and finishes him off. And the first ship manages to sail away scot-free. Lovely little bit of teamwork there from two small ships taking out a much, much bigger opponent. What you're seeing here is actually the result of a successful boarding action. The big ship in the middle, flying the French flag, started this battle as a British ship. That's a victory. And um, he's been boarded and captured by the smaller ship you can see on his starboard side flying the white flag. The white flag indicates that there's no crew on board. It doesn't mean he's surrendered. But that guy has actually managed to pull up alongside that victory, whittled his crew down by sweeping his decks with uh, grape shot, get his crew on board, capture the ship, and now he's sailing it under the French flag. So, naval action. It's shaping up to be a very, very good game. It's very slow paced, but, you, you, you know, it's, this is not World of Tanks. <laughs> this is not even World of Warships. It's a much, much slower paced game than that. Uh, and that's not going to be to everybody's tastes, but at the same time, there's definitely going to be a section of the market out there that has been waiting for this kind of game. And, oh, has he... No, he's managed to get away with it. <laughs> um, oh, I don't know. It looks like he's taken on an awful lot of water there. I think that last round might have been just a little too much. Yep, he's going down. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> Never mind. At least he went down fighting. Um, and don't forget that this is just the PvP section of the game. This is just a small part of what the game is actually going to have. The full release is going to be a huge, massive, open-world, sandbox, naval empire building style of game, of which these PvP fights between ships are just one part. So, naval action. It's available on Steam, although you can't actually purchase it directly via Steam. You have to go to the game website. Link in the video description. Uh, pay for a Steam access code, and then every Friday they mail the Steam codes out to everybody who purchased the one that week. So that's how, if you're interested in this game, or in the early access PvP only version of this game, then that's how you get your hands on a copy. So, naval action. Um, don't forget, this is just one of two videos that I'm uploading today. This is the kind of the bonus video of the day, although I'm putting it up before the main event. The main event is coming at 1800, 6 p.m. Central European time. I'm unable to uh, unveil it to the public any earlier than that. And hopefully it should become apparent why when you see it. World of Tanks video coming up later on today at 1800 Central European time. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you stick around for the next one. Take care, and I'll catch you next time.